So uh, my name's uh, Dennis, actually, and I'm Kate. Right. You're so very welcome to the Meadery. And um, yeah, we're the owners here. I guess we started the Meadery about uh, here in Kinsale, which I guess, I guess I think all you guys are from across the water, are you? Um, uh, um, we started the Meadery back in 2016, actually, um, and then we physically moved into these premises uh, in 2017. It's about 4,000 square foot, so it's a, a Meadery is very similar to Henry, actually, in terms of the process, and we'll take you through that a little bit. But uh, our equipment and our process and so on and our setup it would be very similar to a small winery. Yeah. We, even, we even have the weather that the French <laughs> and the Italians have as well. So it's 27, 28 degrees in Kinsale right yeah. now. So you With a nice get... sea breeze as well, which makes all the difference. Yeah. Me. I hope you're all having a lovely day anyway. Yeah. And um, if you want to ask any questions along the way, uh, our statement till the end either works for us. So if you want to... Um, I'm sure, I'm sure we're all uh, familiar with Zoom now, but you can type them in the chat. Yeah. So any questions on the making or the styles or pairings, yeah. any old stories about yeah, me yeah. that you think we're making up, <laughs> <laughs> you can call us on it. <laughs> Has anyone had me before? No. No? You have, Ross? Aha. All right. All right. So um, I think we'll, um, yeah, so we'll let's, start with the basics. Yeah. So, so, so me... An authentic mead is fermented from honey. It would be very similar to grape wine, but instead of grapes, it, it, it's honey and water and yeast. That, that's the most uh, straightforward recipe for mead. Oh, there's Gary coming in. Thank you all, yeah. you all and, know and, Gary. And, and there's, um, there's different styles of mead. Um, the golden colored meads um, are known as traditional honey meads. So they're very simple drinks, honey, water, yeast. Um, they're simple, but they're actually the most difficult to make. Yeah. There's yeah. nowhere to hide. Yeah. Part, part <laughs> of the reason for that is, is honey has very little nutrients in it, actually. So it's it's a much trickier um, process, right? Making yeah. process. The other styles we make are melamel meads, our wine of the berry. Um, historically, very old drinks as well. The berries were added not so much for flavor and color, but for speed. So if you were in a hurry to get your alcohol back in, Prior tux day, you banged in a load of wild berries and it speeds up the fermentation by about a factor of four or five, depending on the fruits. Mm -hmm. So quite quite dramatic um, process as well in terms of the frothing and the foaming and the vigorousness of the fermentation yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so it is the oldest alcohol in the world. It goes back to at least six and a half thousand BC. Uh, they found some in a grape in China. Um, and they were uh, it, they tested the pottery shards and tell that it was made from fermented honey and rice and flavored with local herbs. So it was definitely a special drink, a, a kind of ceremonial drink at the time. Um, and just to put six and a half thousand BC into context, that's three thousand years before we invented the wheel. So uh, yeah, pretty pretty early. And um, Dennis's um, worst joke on that is that that means there was no drink driving for three thousand yeah. years. So. <laughs> so, that's um, the worst joke we have okay yep. they, go, and it, they get better <laughs> and it, it's a pr it's a pretty global drink historically as well any culture that had honey um figured out at some point how to make alcohol from it i guess some of the most popular places in the world today for mead are probably eastern europe would be one example a lot of it reflects the fact that they have a lot more honey in eastern europe and they've maintained that tradition of mead making a lot longer. You, you'll find meads in Eastern Europe actually are a lot sweeter. Uh, traditionally, Polish meads would probably be the best example. And they're one of the few countries actually that have EU um, uh, protection. regional protection on the, on the styles of mead they do, similar to say Champagne. Um, and then you get places like Ethiopia is another good example. The majority of the honey in Ethiopia is used to make a drink called Tej, which is a, again a form of fermented honey. Every sort of speakeasy she bean in, <laughs> in Ethiopia makes its own form of, of tej and they use probably two thirds of the honey that they produce in Ethiopia for making this um, very interesting and um, quite yeah. sweet uh, and they use the local bark or the bark of a local um, tree as well as part of the, yeah, the, the process. Similar to using hops in beer. Yeah and then I guess the last several years, interestingly enough, the U.S. has has really got interested in mead 
there's probably maybe 500, 600 meaderies in the US now, um, mostly smaller ones, very mm -hmm. regional in their styles as well. So they, they use a lot of regional honey types, fruit types, and um, herb mm -hmm. types, herb and spices, and flavors that are very regional. So you get quite a, a very interesting and so, some very creative, innovative uh, meads across across the US as well. Where yeah, yeah. Um, so you can imagine in the Southwest, they, they put in like mesquite honey and prickly pear and chili, of course, you know. Yeah. Whereas if you go up into the Northwest, you're, you're looking at kind of blueberries and um, just interesting um, honey, including one called meadow foam honey. Yeah, uh, meadow foam. Right right yeah, so the, yeah, so very interesting needs in the US actually. And there, it kind of reminds me a little bit of maybe the craft beer stuff 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, when there was just a lot of very small um, craft brewing going on in the US and that seems a little bit like that's happening with mead a little bit now. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, uh, um, also the terroir in wine. Um, so the way that different grapes make different flavours in wines on a very basic level, different honeys from different nectar sources will make a different flavour mead. Um, so you can have a vast array of different flavours from a honey. So we took quite a long time to decide on the honey that we were going to use for our kind of our main um, traditional style mead and make quite a few batches and, and, and they, they come out quite differently even using the same yeast. So. Yeah, yeah. But we'll, we'll start talking about honey, I think. Yeah, so yeah, so we'll, I think we'll taste the first one in a couple of minutes, but just to kind of introduce you to the core ingredient, I guess. And in general, to make a wine strength mead, so 12, 14% alcohol, you need about one third honey and two thirds water. Um, honey is about 80% super saturated, sugar 82% roughly. So it generally never ferments. You can have a, you know, if you have proper honey, it'll last for hundreds of years in the jar. Thousands. Um, thousands, well. Thousands. <laughs> yeah. they, found, they found a jar or pot in the pyramids and it was perfectly edible for somebody really brave uh, <laughs> offered to taste it. Can you imagine? Yeah. And, and um, we use, um, we use, um, we try and get raw unfiltered honey. A lot of the honey now that, that is mass produced often, often actually isn't honey anymore. It's a mixture of rice syrup and corn syrups and, and heavily adulterated um, honeys. Also the honey actually we consume in Britain and Ireland now is coming from China actually, the vast majority. I guess prior to Brexit, every, I'm not sure the labeling has changed yet, interestingly enough, but it used to, uh, most honeys, uh, were labeled a blend of EU and non-EU, and you could have 99% uh, Chinese honey and a spoon of European honey and still label it like that. So it is one of the most adulterated um, pro uh, food products in the world, actually. But we get our honey raw and filtered. It has, so you'll see the bees wax in it. You'll see bits of bees in it as well. So you get all that protein um, and you'll get some beeswax as well. All goes in the tank. Yeah. And, and it's important that it's, if you flick on it, it's important in general, to get um, um, cold honey as well. This, this is from one of our local beekeepers actually, but um, a lot of mass produced honey is, is um, you know, is, is heated. And in general, if you heat honey over the high temperature, 40 degrees, you start to impact the flavors in the honey. So we try and uh, make sure all our honey is cold extracted like it's done here. It's the beeswax is removed off, off the frames and then it's, it's, it's spun through a centrifuge, the honey, drains out through the bottom and you get a beautiful raw, um, you know, and all that flavor is still there in the honey. Um, yeah. and, and the first honey, or the first meat we're gonna taste tonight is made with a Spanish orange blossom honey. That's one of the nicest honeys we probably have in Europe based on our tasting of many different types. It's a spring honey. So the bees are going into the orange groves um, in the south of Spain. This honey is from south of Valencia. Um, the bees are mostly going there for pollination. The beekeepers are being paid to pollinate the orange groves. Not, they're not <laughs> being, charged, being charged themselves, actually. So you get a lovely fragrant citrus uh, honey coming from these, um, these orange groves. Yeah. And so, the, the oranges that are um, pollinated by the bees, those are the great big ones that they use for extracting juice because they've got pips in. And the um, supermarkets in Europe, the European Western European supermarkets think that we don't like um, oranges with pips in. So those are unpollinated and smaller and less juicy. Yeah, so they don't want the bees actually, strangely enough, going into those orange groves, which yeah, is kind of a... Yeah, I don't know how hard they stop them. Yeah. Like the bees don't go into <laughs> oranges. Anyway, so we're going to try the Atlantic Drive. Um, I hope you all have your minis um, there. Um, 
The Atlantic Dry is the, is the pale gold colored one with the, with the blue wave on it. Um, it should be lightly chilled or if you, if you, you can pour it over ice as well or instead. Yeah. Um, Actually, I think we prefer it over ice mostly, don't we? Oh, I, can, I can do it, I'm, I'm easy. Um, so if we, uh, if we have a, have a, if you give it a swirl and have a smell of it like you do, you're really gonna get floral citrus uh, aromas that are coming from the nectar that's in the orange blossom flower. So it doesn't taste of orange, it tastes of citrus, which is the way that the flower smells. And then your first mouthful, if you're not used to drinking mead, your first mouthful, you're gonna taste honey. That's what you're gonna taste, it's just honey. So it just takes a little while to kind of acclimatize, I suppose. So it's usually on the second taste that you can taste that nearly all of the sugars have been fermented out. It's crisp, it's not sweet, it tastes, of, it's got the honey, lingering honey on the palate there. Yeah, and we actually fermented right down to the last one or two percent of, of sugar. We'll talk about the process a bit later. Mm. Um, but this would be, um, I guess, yeah, an off-dry style. Yeah, it's an off-dry traditional meat. Um, for food pairing, we really like it with salty food. So um, in, in Kinsale, you know, we're, we're really into the seafood, um, uh, things like um, olives and, and salted nuts. We were at a food festival when we used to be able to do food festivals next to crisp stand. Um, so apart from eating a load of crisps, we found out that a big handful of salty crisps and a little glass of Atlantic Dry is a really good food pairing uh, that we'd never have thought of if we hadn't been at the festival. And um, also for a Middle Eastern kind of um, uh, desserts like baklava and, and goat cheese and actually lighter blue cheeses as well are, are fantastic with this one. Um, yeah, the seafood dishes we did were, were like oysters in the shell, raw oysters with a little um, glass of this. Uh, scallops yes, scallop. is a creamy is beautiful scallop. creamy scallop yeah. uh, dishes as well. It's lovely. Yeah, and um, so if you if you're into the cocktails, this is a fabulous um, mead cocktail. The bee's knees is a is a classic 1920s cocktail when the gin was literally made in in bathtubs, um, and they had to disguise the flavour and the smell by adding honey and lemon. So this is. Um, Two parts of Atlantic Dry, a good clean gin. You see some super gins actually coming out of the north now, as well as the south. Just don't get them too too over flavoured, I guess, because it overwhelms it. Honey syrup, which is honey mixed with warm water and some lemon juice. So super classy. Uh, do it in a coupe glass or a champagne flute. Very easy, very easy to make um, and very refreshing. Um, great for um, all gin drinkers such as myself. So yeah. We've seen some nice ones done with tequila as well. Um, uh, what was that one, Kate? Um, so he was using gorse flower syrup. Again, yeah. kind of similar. Uh, um, lemon ju uh, lime juice, uh, tequila, and, and the so Atlantic nice. Dry. It's really nice. <laughs> yeah, the bee's knees is just wonderful, actually. But like I said, uh, our Kate said, a lovely classic gin, just the real juniper flavor rather than some of the the heavily botanical meads, uh, um, yeah. uh, gins you you get right now from a lot of people. Yep. And if you'd like us to try out any of your gins, just send them to the meadery. We're happy <laughs> to try them out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's lots, there's lots of other um, cocktails. The, the mixologists get really excited when the new flavors to play with. So we've done a mule with ginger ale and apple juice. So that's that's fairly low in alcohol. Um, uh, like a Bellini style. Yeah. Um, um, oh, what the, the, the Don of Kinsale, which is again Don Julio uh, tequila with grapefruit juice and uh, uh, some agave nectar. Agave nectar and, 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 and the meat is another really, lovely drink. Really good. <laughs> yeah, Gar is Gary's a bee's knee, yes. <laughs> so, all right, so um, um, the next slide is going to yeah. show you a little bit about how we make the mead. So, yeah, here we go. Yeah, so it's it's very like making wine, actually. It's probably the best description in the sense that instead of using grapes or pressed grapes, we're using honey and honey and fruit for the melamel fruit meat. So here we are. This is one. This is our barrel of honey, uh, one of our barrels of honey. So this is, is about 300 kilograms of honey. So it comes to us like this. 
thick, um, you'll get beeswax on the top. And this is a dark forest honey we actually use from northern Spain in some of our um, melamel fruit meads. Smoky, beautiful honey from deciduous forests. Um, lovely summer honey, um, if you ever get the chance to try some of this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and basically, we're, we're adding the honey and water together, mixing it one third honey, roughly two thirds water, um, never too hot because you'll damage the flavors in the honey if you over um, heat the honey or, or, or put in too hot water. So there's Kate with her witch's wand, mixing it all up. And those behind it are, are our thousand liter tanks. So one of those barrels of honey. And then we, we use wine yeast mostly. Um, you can use champagne yeast and you can use actually lots of different yeast depending on, on the kind of um, flavor profile and structure you're trying to get. But and we mostly use white wine yeast. And then at about 17 degrees centigrade roughly, we will um, ferment. It takes about 28 days to ferment. Um, so for all the sugars, or for in our case, 98, 99% of the sugars to be fermented out. Um, so it's a relatively slow fermentation process. Actually, the lower the temperature you can use, um, the better. It seems to preserve a lot of, of the floral aromas and flavors in the honey um, that then sort of doing it at higher, like some other um, alcohols are, are fermented at. So that's sort of the, the basic um, oh, yeah. honey. This is a little bit of history. Um, so uh, mead in the British Isles, the earliest that I've been able to find is around about 2000 BC in the Outer Hebrides, they found some. Um, the historians get a bit argumentative about um, whether it's mead, whether it's honey, whether it's baking, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> so, um, but th this is certainly a, a fantastic. A, a mead vessel that they, they found uh, along Hadrian's Wall there, um, which is really cool. The, the Romans were drinking mead, um, yeah, for hundreds of years, and it, it's it's in the the, the Latin. Um, yeah, the Latin and actually that, that that brings up another. You'll see some um, kind of I, I call them quote unquote meads that are a mixture of white wine and honey. Actually, some of them, I think, some of the meads in the UK are, are done in that style. They're not really meads per se, and um, they're, they're actually drinks called molson. Um, I, I don't think you can actually label them as meads in some countries, mm. um, but they are they are more white wine as the is, is where the alcohol is coming from, and then you're adding in some form of of honey, uh, spiced honey, spiced honey syrup or, or spiced honey mixed into the. So those those can be quite sweet because you're taking the white wine, adding a very sweet um, um, you know compound to it. Yep. What the next one is. Oh, so yeah. in, in Ireland then, um, they haven't dug anything up as early as 2000 BC, but the um, the, the words for things like beekeeper um, turn up in the Irish language around about the 5th century AD. And that's when people, so presumably when they started to write it down, they'd already been talking about it for a while. But the, the, um, the, the saint that gets the credit with introducing the honeybee into Ireland is St. Molliga. And he is a local saint to us. He's in from Timolig, which is just along the coast from us, at maybe what, 25 minutes? Yeah. And he was a, a fifth century monk. He, he trained in Scotland and in Wales. And while he was in Wales, he's the beekeeper. Um, and uh, then he was sent back to Ireland to start converting us all to Christianity. And the story goes that his bees missed him and they followed his ship across the Irish Sea. So he settled in there. He, he probably gave him, a, gave him a little bit of a lift by carrying them in one of these beehives. These are called skep beehives. So he settled in Timolig um, and, and, and founded an abbey. And Timolig in Irish is Tigmolig, the house of Molliga. Yeah, historically, actually, we think mead in the British Isles was a, a lower alcohol dry drink because they would have been, um, they would have been um, fermenting the leftovers, actually. Honey was such a precious substance to us because we didn't have an alternative sweetener for many, many centuries, that the primary use for honey wasn't to make alcohol. So it was actually the leftovers of the cappings. So the wax cappings and the leftover from those skep hives. It was, water was added to that, boiled up, and beeswax was lifted off. And then that leftover honey water was actually fermented into alcohol. So we think uh, definitely compared to Eastern Europe, meads in the British Isles were probably um, lower strength and dry and fizzy, and, and fizzy too, because yeah. obviously the byproduct of the fermentation is carbon dioxide, 
where taking your meat straight after fermentation, you'd be getting a kind of almost like a, a fizzy cider type drink. Mm. Um, and actually leading on to our next mead, they'd have been putting fruit into the ferment, as was we were saying earlier, to speed up the fermentation. So the next one we're going to try is the wild red. Um, you all got that one. This would be more room temperature, although on a really hot day like today, I might cool it down a little bit. Um, I mean, much sugar like you would with, with wine in a very hot country. And it like, doesn't happen very often here. So, <laughs> wild red mead, 12% alcohol. It's fermented from that honey that you saw on the video. And uh, black currants from Wexford, which are fantastic, full of flavor. Um, and uh, the tartness is balanced with sweetness from dark cherries. It's matured in the tank for about two years, so it is very smooth and um, almost vinous, um, but you're really getting the fruit, the black currants and the cherries there. And this is known as whole food fermented, actually, so we don't press uh, the fruit at all like you do in most wines. It just gets a very light maceration from its own weight in the tank, so it's the fruit pressing down in itself. Um, and that keeps it much fruitier and allows you to sort of, it's just much, um, it just matures, seems to mature much earlier and you can bottle it a lot sooner as well, actually. Yeah. Um, and there's very low tannins as well because we, we don't really crush the, the berries and the skins. So very smooth, fantastic with food where you want to cut through the fat. So barbecue food, actually, we've been saying recently. So barbecue ribs and sausages, we did it with a bean, bean fajitas, actually, it was nice. Um, and dark chocolate, it's just fantastic yeah. with, with chocolate. Um, Lots of hard cheeses as well, right? Yeah, Kate? yeah, mature, good mature cheddar would be uh, uh, just just lovely with this. Um, actually, Wensleydale, I think, would be nice as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then in the winter, although it's really hard to imagine in July, in the winter, uh, we mull it, so we heat it up gently with gentle slices, so um, star anise, a uh, strip of... Um, orange peel, cinnamon, and a couple of spoons of honey, and it just warms up, warms it through. You don't want to boil it or anything. Um, and then that just, it smells, it just, just makes the whole place smell of this lovely mulled mead, and it's just a lovely winter warmer. Um, and then so, that's nice. the, um, the other cocktail that I was going to show you is hopefully here. Oh, no, it's not here. All right, I've missed the other cocktail. The other cocktail I was going to show you was um, a perfect Irish Manhattan, which is with the Atlantic Dry and equal parts Atlantic Dry, Wild Red, and um, oh, a whiskey. Okay, a good... Um, yeah, so it's really instead of vermouths, uh, these, yeah. we've seen several cocktails where these kind of work well. They're, the red and the white work instead of vermouths. Yeah, that's right. If you want something maybe not as strong yeah, so or in flavour. Boulevardier uh, is really nice with this. Um, we did it actually with, I don't know if you've come across the Amaro that they make in Dublin. Um, and um, Negroni, yeah, really good. Um, yeah, I think we find as well interesting that, um, that, you know, people who don't like red wines, they find, you know, they can be quite heavy. Maybe the younger ones are a bit harsh with the tannin levels. That um, that the wild red works well. We've had a lot of people who say they don't, you know, they they, they wouldn't drink red wine, but they don't get any of that, that I guess, effect yeah. they get from from <laughs> yeah. the, the heavy red wines. Which is, I'm not sure. We're not really sure whether it is just the tannin levels or if there's something else in the process we're doing that just seems to give it that lightness. Um, and, yeah. and eases any after effects compared to red wines. <laughs> you can't really say it's hangover free, but um, you it's You can't say that yeah. out loud. <laughs> so the other thing is, so uh, whiskey drinkers nearly always go for Atlantic Dry. It's, it's just it's just some kind of universal rule. I don't know why. Don't understand yeah. that. Um, so I was going to show you onto the, the videos we just just started running there. So no. this is Mrs. Making a Melomel Mead. So. Talk to this then. Yeah, so this is very similar to making red wine. Um, you know, one of the very important things, uh, if you want to get it, keep it really light and, you know, get all that, those kind of fruit aromas and flavors is vigorous aeration. So this is a pump over. Um, um, so we're pumping the, this is in primary fermentation. We're pumping the liquid over the top. The fruit actually, um, in this tank, we actually bag. So it's, it's a quite a different process from red wine. 
we actually keep the fruit, we freeze the fruit first, helps the cell walls to disintegrate. Then we actually bag the fruit into large basketball sized mesh bags. Um, and then off it goes fermenting. As Kate said, it's a very vigorous fermentation. Actually, there is one of our early batches um, where we fill the tank right up to the top. And this is four or five days into ferment fermentation. And it's, it's, um, it's just frothing and bubbling. Um, anytime we do a mini pump over, to, to, um, to just also um, spread the yeast around. Um, it, it just, there's so much carbon dioxide in it and it's fermenting so vigorously, it can just froth up, you know, two, three feet. <laughs> and you can get nice, uh, ferment, right? you can get oh, yeah. nice uh, shapes on, on the ground. And the other thing too, I mean, you can, you, you get this light maceration from when you drain a lot of the liquid out during that aeration, you get the fruit is it, pressing down on the um, on itself, so that's where you get the press from, um, and that's that very light maceration that is similar in style to some 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 of the very light um, Italian or Spanish kind of um, wines that are more summer drinks. Um, mm -hmm. um, and then I guess at the end of fermentation, actually, we do something called a, a cold crash, so we don't let it ferment all the ways. You notice in, in the one you just had, there is that lingering hint of honey. That's at just that one or two percent of sugar that's left um, um, in the honey. So we actually cold crash it. We take the temperature right down to a couple of degrees, um, and that knocks out the yeast basically. And we can stop the fermentation just before its natural end point, um, so it's not a completely dry finish on it. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, shall we have the hazy summer? Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. So the, the third and um, final one of these are our main means is the hazy summer. This has a slightly different label style, which I love, um, and it's representing Kinsale. If you've ever been down here, um, or if you haven't, you need to come. Uh, it's because that's the lighthouse from the old head of Kinsale. Um, there's yachts in the harbour. They were all out today. It was a beautiful um, day on, on, on the harbour. And obviously that's me with the big hat. So it's called Hazy Summer Mead um, because it's summer berries. It's six different summer berries all, uh, all squashed into the, the bottle there. Um, so it's uh, younger than the wild red, probably six to eight months before we bottle it. Um, if you had, give it a swirl and have a smell, it'll be lightly chilled as well. Strawberries and raspberries on the nose, you get that? And then on the tongue. All the other berries, basically. So blackberries, um, dark cherries, um, what have I forgotten? Black currants and blueberries. I get the blueberries more on the finish along with the honey, which is that, that kind of slightly smoky Spanish forest honey there. It's, it's um, very fruity, it's, it's younger, it can handle spicy food, and um, so spicy chicken wings are fantastic with this. Um, or, or what else? Oh yeah, and berry desserts, so um, like uh, berry cheesecake. Uh, and actually, if you've, got, if you've got a little thing of uh, vanilla ice cream, if you pour some, um, some hazy summer over that, it's like an instant raspberry ripple, so. Yeah, I think this is when we made this first and tasted it. I think we were thinking this is like an Irish Pims or something because we, we don't really have a tradition of a berry drink, a summer berry drink in Ireland at all, actually. We just go from Guinness to white wine, do we? Rosé, <laughs> <laughs> it's all rosé. Well, maybe rosé, yeah. not even much rosé, but whereas no. you, you, you have your, your sort of Pims drinks in the UK. And um, we thought, yeah, this is like an Irish Pims. It's very much that, that lovely fruity flavour with the strawberries and raspberries. Mm. That, that um, And that's kind of where we've seen it served or... Um, with um, you know a glass of this over ice with some frozen berries, frozen strawberries or raspberries, blueberries, um, a slice of orange on top maybe. So it's yeah. a lovely, colourful kind of summer drink as well. Easy for you know, easy for the, the you know your barman, your mixologist to make up yeah. um, and serve on a hot day like today, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's also only eleven percent, so you can drink ten percent more of this one than the other two. Is that the mead max? <laughs> And it makes it a really good sangria, which I'm hoping is my next slide. Let me just see. Oh, no, there's the, there's the perfect Irish Manhattan. We've kind of done that now. 
Uh, we'll come back to himself. Oh, bottle Here we go. So the Celtic mead sangria is with Cointreau, cranberry juice, and a dash of fresh lime. A little bit of Cointreau with the orange flavor. Um, so it keeps it quite low in alcohol. And it's just, it's a fabulous sunny day drink. And um, if you shake it up with ice, you can get it to frost like that, um, which just looks super cool. Um, really popular and again, easy, easy to do in a big jug or something. Yeah, we've seen a few other, we've seen it served with um, with gin as well, haven't we, Kate? And, oh yeah, there's a pink um, gin cocktail. They're, they're on the website if you're looking for some ideas. A pink, pink, kind of a pink punch. It was really good. Yeah, and our what's our local, um, what does uh, the Jim Edwards restaurant do? He does a mead, a mead in heaven. Mead, a mead in mead heaven, heaven cocktail. <laughs> that goes down very well as well. I think that's, that's gin. That's, that's gin, and, gin uh, and I think it's a sweet red vermouth. Yeah, and yes, some of the meat together. That's yeah. nice. And um, so I was going to go back to this one. Yeah, so we'll, we'll touch on the last few just bits of fun history. Um, we'll talk to this. Yeah, this one actually is, is kind of leads into more uh, 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 our drinking vessels for mead actually in, in Ireland, anyhow, for sure. Maybe possibly in Scotland a bit too. Um, but yeah, this is... Um, this is um, uh, the Great Mead Hall of Tara. It's actually in west of Dublin, about 20 miles west of Dublin. It's It was the, I guess it's the equivalent of Camelot for Irish kings is probably the best description. It's where our high kings used to reside on the hill of Tara. Um, and there's two great ring forts at the back of the picture that most people know in Ireland. But at the back, there was this long rectangular building known as Chuck McCorta, the Great Mead Hall. And it, it used, it was also known as the Circling Hall the tradition of passing the mead cups around in a circle. They used to hold about 1,100 people in the 7th century. So it was, it was our biggest pub in Ireland, <laughs> predominantly used in November. So that brings up, this is quite a fun one. But we used to drink mead out of something called methers, actually. So um, contrary to sort of popular culture with the drinking horns, um, drinking horns actually weren't that common um, as a mass for mass drinking because uh, we didn't actually have a lot of horns. Um, there appeared to have been a shortage of drinking horns from like uh, around the Viking times from what we've read. So so we used to drink out of wooden drinking vessels of different shapes and sizes. In Ireland, we had something called methers, M-E-T-H-E-R-S. I think they're mentioned in Scotland a good bit too. Um, and the ones in Ireland were, were big ones like this, four handled. You can see this is actually not a jointed, it's carved from a single piece of sycamore, showed up around the 11th century, maybe earlier. And then lasted for maybe four or five hundred years until the end of the traditional Gaelic culture, um, and and actually the you you may have seen the sport of hurling in Ireland, um, the the team that gets the winning cup every year in our national championships actually it's a big silver cup. It's based on an old mead drinking cup that was inaugurated about a hundred years ago, but these were around for maybe four hundred years. This is actually I'll show you the smaller one is is actually interesting too. Um, but they were the big ceremonial cups that we could drink a couple of gallons of meat out of. This was, um, as somebody said to me yesterday on the tour, th this was our medieval shot glass. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but th this actually is a, a lovely one. This is uh, very similar to one in the National Museum in Dublin. It's, I think it's from the 1300s maybe. Um, and again, it's a smaller piece of sycamore. It's kind of uh, square, but it's actually tapered at the corner. So you... You think when you pick it up, you drink out the middle, but as it turns out, there was a trick to it where the corners were tapered further down and the, and the middle was, was actually um, a little bit higher. So if you drink out of this in the middle, it all goes down your shirt on either side. So there's references to uh, um, play, playing tricks on people you didn't really like, visiting dignitaries and things like that. You give them politicians yeah. in George and Dublin, for example, yeah. you'd give them their method of whatever meat, wine or mead. And then hopefully you'd watch it all um, go down, the go down their, sh their shirts, yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that they, they'll be drinking out of, of methods um, at, at celebrations, so at festivals and events, but also at weddings. Um, the Lord was saying, I'm using my precious allocation of honey to make this delicious drink, share with my honoured guest. They'd, um, take, he'd take the first sip and it would pass around the table in the direction of the sun and he'd finish uh, with the last sip, which isn't very COVID friendly. Uh, but then they would give for weddings, they would give the couple a month's supply or a moon cycle of mead to drink after the wedding. So you have honey moon. 
you see? And that's supposedly the origins of the word honeymoon. <laughs> yeah, honeymoon. 28 days of drinking, which is a great start. And um, so 28 bottles for all those weddings that are coming up in the next year. Yeah. So they were the methers, and they were, I think they existed in Scotland as well, in different shapes, some silver ones. But they were our, um, and they haven't been made in about 400 years, actually. They were the first two, I think, to be made in Ireland since maybe the 1700s, actually. Mm -hmm. It's quite fun. So that's kind of just a, a quick fly through um, our meads, actually. Yeah, to touch on then just a little bit on some of the other meads we've made, they're, they're limited edition ones, really. Um, um, we've made a, um, a lovely traditional mead as well, similar to the first one you tasted. We've made it slightly sweeter using 100% summer wildflower honey um, from Ireland. So we've done that just to, we really wanted to produce um, uh, a mead from local honey. Yeah, and so there, that, that there's the first Irish mead made commercially from Irish honey in about 200 years. Yeah. And because, as we mentioned, there's so little um, um, real honey, you know, in, in, in Britain and Ireland, really, that we just wanted to be able to say that there's something from, you know, from true source local honey. And the other meads that are really interesting actually are um, herbed or spice meads and, and I guess barrel age roughly falls under that too. So we've also done some um, barrel age meads. These are, are very interesting kind of additional complex flavors, right? Yeah. Do you want to flash up it? I don't know if you had it there or not. Um, but um, we've taken in particular the red, um, the second one you tasted there tonight, and um, again, it's looking at the provenance of, of our locality. Uh, Kinsale historically used to be a big wine port, actually, contrary to popular opinion. And the Irish didn't drink lots of Guinness, Pochine or whiskey. We used to drink a tremendous amount of red wine. Part of that was because of the strong connections between France and Ireland from the, the late uh, 1600s onwards. Um, and Kinsale was a big wine port in its day. Um, Bordeaux wines in particular used to come in from Irish, vin Irish French vineyards, Irish named vineyards. So um, in 2019, we actually got some barrels from um, some French vineyards um, known as the wild geese wines, actually. And we aged our, that second mead you had tonight in some Merlot barrels. We mm. sold them all out actually very quickly, but they, um, they added a wonderful additional complexity to the wild red mead. So we obviously got the flavors from the Merlot. We got, uh, it, they were actually Lynch, um, Michael Lynch barrels. Um, we got the flavor from the wood coming through, medium toast. Um, and it just added, and then we had the extra year of aging as well. So they were three years aged. Um, mm -hmm. And then we also took the first one you had tonight, the Atlantic Dry. And we've done that in a couple of different barrel styles so far. We've done it in a white port um, barrels and also in Sautern. Barrels. So it's, it's, it's maybe closer to the original provenance of mead three or four hundred years ago when it would have been aged in barrels. Yeah. Almost certainly reused barrels coming in from the continent being emptied and then mead being fermented uh, or mat matured for certain in, in, um, in those barrels. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And we actually won, we won Drink of the Year from the Irish Food Writers Guild for the Merlot Barrel Aged World Red Mead, which was Fantastic, that was just a couple of months ago, but we'd sold out by then. <laughs> so we're some more maturing now and we're thinking maybe the autumn, um, judging by judging by the taste at the moment, because we have to taste it regularly because that's our job. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah. But it does make for some very interesting, we, we've, we've had some uh, sommeliers taste some of the barrel age and they find it quite tricky actually um, to figure out its, its provenance and its source. Um, which is good because they're comparing it to some very good wines from, you know, mostly France they were comparing it with, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. So that's, I think that's, that's yeah. Really do, do you want 